How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? In this video, we'll be covering all the lore in the game known as Town of Salem. The order of the video is important, so I'd recommend listening to it from start to finish. The video will be audiobook style, so strap yourselves in, buckle up, and enjoy the show. As a young child, the witch was used to being bullied. Everywhere she went, she was made fun of. Whether it was her abnormally large nose, her off-shade green skin, or just the fact that she carried a broom around wherever she went, the town had completely shunned her. She was banished to the far forests, left to her own devices and her own magic. Throughout the years of being completely alone, she had studied magic day and night, and with the help of her black cat as a lab rat of sorts, she had learned to make people do whatever she pleased. With her newfound talent, she moved back into the town, taking up home under the guise of a regular townsperson. The witch vowed to take revenge on everyone that had ever bullied her. That meant working with those who some may consider evil. After failing her first attempt at destroying Salem, the witch traveled 260 years into the future to recruit more allies. She returned with the Mafia, and with them, recommenced her conquest against Salem. The Old West was wild, but it never prepared the Sheriff for what he had to face. On the run from the Mafia, the battle-hardened Sheriff knew that his only escape was to fly far away from his homeland and start a new life in the quiet town of Salem. But as he took the long journey by road to this town, the Mafia was constantly on his trail. He soon realized that his own business should have stayed his own, because the Mafia began to kill an innocent town member each night in an effort to weed him out of hiding. But the Sheriff stood his ground and knew that surrendering was no option. He had to fight them and find these evildoers through the grueling interrogations he performed each night. The Godfather leans back in his chair, a cigar puffing out amongst his accomplices. So, any idea who should fall tonight? The Consig speaks up. The man on 5th Avenue, the one with the limp. He's our investigator. He's the one we should take out. The Godfather nods his head slowly and glances towards the two men sitting on his right. Both men glance at each other and then look back towards the Godfather. Then it's done, the Godfather says. Suddenly, a knock is heard at his door. He stands up. He opens the door, and there stands the Sheriff. Known as a well-established businessman, he answers the Sheriff's probing questions, shakes his hand, and sends him on his way. As he goes back to his chair, Gunshots ring out at 5th Avenue, and a satisfied smile spreads across the Godfather's face. During the day, he shakes hands and makes friends, claiming to be the town's best doctor. However, in the night, he slowly wanders home through the streets of Salem to his humble abode. When he arrives, he pulls out a large knife and cleans it with the greatest of care. A piece of equipment for his patients or for his victims. Little does this not really innocent town know that this person has been striking fear into their hearts for several nights. But in the day, he acts as if he wishes to help the townies and save lives. But in the night, preys upon the weak using his worn weapon, slowly making one unlucky soul of the town suffer each night. He is their nightmare, a serial killer. Who is next? This fiend thinks to himself. He finally decides to attack an elderly man known for his wise words throughout Salem. As he exits his home, he quickly, yet quietly, walks to the poor soul's house, hoping not to be seen. He arrives and knocks on the elderly man's door. The man opens the door with a great warmness 
inviting this killer inside. The instant he walks in and the door becomes shut, he pulls the overused weapon out from inside his cloak and pounces upon the man, taking him to the ground as a twisted smile forms across his face. He then slowly raises the large knife and drives it into the man's chest, laughing sadistically as he does so. After what little of a struggle the wise man put up is over, the sadistic fiend washes himself off and returns to his home in the night for what little rest he can get before going back to his charade the next morning. It was a cold room, distant from the rest of the world. Cigar smoke abundant in the air. The translucent substance masking two figures sitting across from one another. I was unsure to who else I could seek, truth is. When I broke out, my urge to kill was too much for me to control. Who better than the Godfather? Utter silence filled the room, and the smoke began to dissipate. The Godfather rolls his tongue around in his mouth before speaking rest assuringly. Very well, Mr. Serial Killer. I'm a family man. I'll take care of you, but in return, I ask of one thing. The serial killer's smile widened. Oh? He asked faintly. That you treat this family as they are. Family. More so than even your own. Capiche? Replied the man across from him, a serious look on his face. The serial killer shrugged. My family died. I killed them. But I can assure you, that won't happen. So as long as you keep me occupied said the serial killer in return. A grim smirk formed across the godfather's face, and he leaned back in his chair, propping his feet on the table between the two, placing a cigar in his mouth and lighting it. The male spoke. Though gibberish in sounding, still audible. I have the perfect place for you, my friend, he continued on, shifting the cigar away from his lips and I think you'll fulfill its purpose rather well. The words echoed in the back of the serial killer's mind as he leaped from the bushes tackling a nosy lookout, digging his knife into the unsuspecting victim's chest countless times. A crazed look filled the murderer's eyes as he laughed, admiring his victim's demise. The godfather watched from afar, a satisfied grin on his face. Only those who admire you from a distance will know, my sweet ambusher. Strength. This was the only suitable quality known for a boy throughout his entire life. When he was young, he despised all other kids his age. They had such luxury, such privilege that the boy never had. While they were all gathered around to talk about the latest toys that their parents had given them, the child watched in the distance. A neglectful childhood led the boy to a newfound home, a training camp for soldiers. He was addicted. Every night for 10 years, he would sneak in and train all through the night. This had shown him real happiness, something he had never experienced before. Eventually, the Godfather heard of the news of a man who had bent steel bars and smashed cement like it was glass. He was impressed, and he needed someone to deal with that pesky sheriff who kept bothering him every night. He arranged to meet this juggernaut in person. The Godfather promised ample compensation for the juggernaut's specific set of skills. It was at that moment a vigilante had kicked down the door and raised his gun to the new partners in crime. I knew it, the vigilante exclaimed, staring at the plans that the Godfather had carelessly left strewn on the table. The Godfather simply grinned, assuming his new muscle would take care of this threat. But all the Juggernaut felt when he saw the gun in his face was an immeasurable rage. The next day, the town mourned the loss of the former town hero, who had his own gun stabbed through his torso when he tried to fight against the Mafia head-on. As the crime scene was investigated more, however, the sadness quickly turned to blind confusion. They found, lying under his desk, the leader of the Mafia, his arms torn clean 
from his body. The sun had set already. The people of the town moved along the paths and the streets of a lamplit Salem after the town's afternoon meeting. One figure, his hand moving to the doorknob to his house, had suddenly found himself in a blindfold and handcuffs. With no chance of resistance, he was hauled away under the cover of darkness. He would not be in his bed that night, nor out doing his duty. Instead, he would find himself tossed in a pitiful jail. Stone walls, a small cot, and a bucket were the only materials inside. After a long and dreadful wait, the barred window of the cell's only metal door let through a voice in a sovereign tone. What is your role in this mess? The figure alone in the cell sweats and looks from the cell door back up towards the bars. The voice sounds again compelling and potent in its ultimatum. Make your claim, or you will die here. Handcuffed and nervous, he calls out, I am the doctor. I was trying to help someone. It didn't work. He could hear the sound of a gun being taken out of its holster. The sovereign voice of the jailer sounds again. I had a visit from the doctor yesterday. The door opens. A pistol points at the cuffed figure inside the cell. The jailer then said, it wasn't you. With many years at university spent honing surgical precision and biomedical research, the doctor is an innovative combat surgeon, skilled in recovering the most traumatic of injuries, even in just a single night. When the doctor returned into a humble life as Salem's local physician, the mayor became suspicious of his miraculous abilities to heal people in the most critical conditions. He cut funding to the town hospital and threatened to banish the doctor out of fear for association with witchcraft. For his corrupt accusations, the doctor then swore to never, ever heal the mayor again. Years later, far past his prime, the doctor still secretly checks up on the good people of Salem, even if he gets him exiled. The Mafia's assaults and the serial killer's stabbings, even a vampire's bite or a werewolf's rage, are nothing to the doctor's medical skills and refined operating techniques. Despite this, he has one foe he cannot combat, the arsonist. So much to the doctor's regret, the targets of the arsonist are beyond his reach. He can do little for patients who have been charred beyond recognition. Good luck. A subtle saying used in a way to instill the false sense of innocence in someone. It seemed to be a kind gesture towards the other people in the town, but to the arsonist, it was nothing more than a veiled threat, thrown out loudly with a devilish smile. He only said it because he knew the town would need it. Once the night came, his fun began. He walked slowly and proudly through the roads of lamplit Salem, with a puff in his chest and a spring in his step. He is the one who visits other houses, brandishing a gas can, whistling nonchalantly. The only thing you hear from him is a satisfied sigh once his can becomes empty. Three nights later, two people had been hanged, the town sheriff and a jester, who was likely to take another soul this coming night. The town was in paranoia, throwing accusations, claiming their neighbors were evil, angrily calling those who did not agree idiots, and others just mumbled to themselves, stupid town. But to him, it was fading into the noises of birds chirping, water rushing, and far within his mind, the screams of people burning. The night forced everyone into their homes, but the arsonist's job wasn't over yet. Lighting a torch and setting it into his Dow's neighbor's house, his ash-stained lips murmured, Ignite. A young child reaches out through a gap in the rubble of what used to be her home. The area was filled with smoke, and the crying child was covered in ashes. Small flames dotted the debris and danced in place. Another arsonist attack, said the sheriff. What a shame. 
a lovely house and family too. The investigator he spoke to nodded silently, his gaze wavering around until he caught sight of a helpless child trapped in place. He broke into a run towards the area. The girl begins to sob as the investigator kneels next to her and attempts to pull a wooden beam off of her. It's going to be alright dear, just hold still. His voice is nothing but indecipherable mumbles to the girl, who instead gazes onward to a strange glowing ball of light that has descended from the sky before her. The orb soon branches out into a torso, arms, legs, hands. She stepped down in front of the girl and ran her hand along her face, wiped her tears with a gentle finger. Don't cry my love, she whispered, her voice a soothing song. I am your guardian angel. Working as an undercover genius underneath the sheriff, the investigator sets off on his quest to bring the mafia and the serial killer to justice. However, it seems that his time was short-lived, but he never had enough evidence to convict the town doctor of being the serial killer. The janitor had cleaned up so many bodies that he had no idea if the serial killer was dead or not. Eventually, he went in with all guns blazing, putting his luck on the line, accusing the doctor of being a serial killer. They lynched him, and the investigator was surprisingly quiet after that. The woman grew up in the town as an average kid with an average childhood and an average education. The same monotonous routine of her daily life was simple until she decided on a goal to finally strive for. She decided to become a private investigator like on the detective shows her parents would occasionally watch. In her young adult years, she had followed around a man she revered as the best investigator in town, who had subdued numerous criminals and psychopaths in his career. By following the investigator, she slowly built up a well of knowledge in how to properly find information and people's secrets. The woman rose to the top in popularity as an outstanding detective resolving many cases over her young adult career. At the age of 31, she chose to test herself by attempting to investigate the man she had previously worshipped as her inspiration, only to discover the dirty truth. I just couldn't believe any of it. The lies that created the very foundation of this town. It was all just so despicable. It had all been covered up. The sheriff, jailer, and even the mayor had all hidden what this investigator had done in order to protect the so-called justice of this filthy place. She then turned to the only people in the town who probably knew this truth alongside her, the Mafia. With her expertise in the field of investigation, she tracked down the Godfather and asked him one simple request, help me destroy this town. The investigator walks into an old ramshackle house. He had received a lead on this person which he didn't want to ignore. He was glad he didn't. There were pictures everywhere and all of them were of the nurse with red painted X's across their face. This person clearly had a problem. Perhaps it was an enemy or maybe just a poor soul targeted by this insane lunatic. All the accusations made sense now. Every time suspicion was placed on the poor nurse, this executioner made sure the whole town was convinced they were guilty. No wonder he was so upset when the town realized they had been tricked and voted the nurse innocent. The investigator sat down and tried to make sense of what could drive someone to target such an innocent nurse. He racked his brain. Perhaps it was a long time ago when the nurse accused him. But obviously, this obsession was going way further than that. No one knows why the executioner targets you, but their silver tongues will try their hardest to get you lynched, whatever the cost may be. 
after his ship, world's wench marooned at the cliffs, young Skullbeard had little to his name than a few choice of weapons. He needed to find wealth fast. No landlubber would suspect that the wanted sign denouncing Skullbeard's name and face with a lord-sized bounty on his head would in fact be the newcomer to the town. When the investigator retired to his house after council, he saw the sign on his front door. He immediately recognized the culprit and turned around just in time to meet the blackened teeth and grog breath of his adversary. Skullbeard lurched forward slowly. The investigator fled into his home and went looking for something, anything to defend himself with. The pirate already knew which weapon he would use to slay this useless landfarer. He opened the door to his bedroom, meeting his prey, not even 10 feet from where he stood. The investigator was fearful, but determined to stand his ground. Had no idea they used chainmail here. On guard, yelled Skullbeard. The following day, the pirate was halfway to his goal of fleeing this town. He was ill prepared, but he still knew how to send his foes with a one way ticket to Davy Jones's locker. A young man, ex military, dressed in black, patrols the houses of the town at night, struggling to make a living. He decided that he could make money protecting others, knowing that anyone and anything could be lurking in the night. The job paid well, so well that the mayor offered to pay him personally for protection, and so far, nobody he protected had been attacked. But one fateful night, seemingly so much like every other night he had experienced, would be his last. It was one in the morning, and he was standing by the mayor's house, listening and watching for any strange occurrences. Suddenly, he heard a bang, and the door of the mayor's house had been forced open. The bodyguard sprinted into action. He turned the corner into the house, loaded his own gun, and yelled, Freeze! At the mafioso bolting into the mayor's study. The mafioso had no choice. He turned around and unloaded his machine gun, fatally wounding the bodyguard. But as the loyal guardsman crumpled in pain, he shot the mafioso three times, killing him before he hit the floor. The bodyguard knew he would die, as there was no doctor to be seen. But despite his fate, he had saved a fellow town member from the mafia. He had finally done his job. He closed his eyes, smiled wistfully, and passed into eternity. Until a few nights ago, the Crusader was always willing to sacrifice his life for that of another townie. It was a noble deed, and it was the bodyguard's job. But one night, while on guard, it occurred to him that if he had just shot the visitor before they attacked, he could protect whomever he was supposed to protect and live. So the Crusader stood. He was on a mission. Not just to protect the owner of this house, but to get rid of all the evil in this town. He would save the town, and then survive to become a celebrated hero at the end. As he began to think this night would be as uneventful as all the other nights, he heard soft footsteps. Three clean shots stopped the serial killer's reign of terror. As the crusader kicked the body over, knives glinted in the moonlight. Hearing the gunshots from the home he planned to visit, the mafioso lurking not too far away, turned back home. The godfather would be angry, but a mad godfather was better than a dead mafioso. Morning came and the joyful crusader practically skipped to the town square, where the dead would be announced. As the townies woke up, they stared at each other, observing who was absent. The mayor called for everyone's attention, as the sheriff dragged the body out in the middle of the square. This townie was killed by a crusader last night, the sheriff stated. The townies pointed to a shabby house, identifying it as the dead person's house. The sheriff and the investigator entered. The crusader tensed in anticipation. In a few seconds, they would announce that the serial killer was dead. 
It was only when the sheriff raised his head, his grim demeanor became visible. The crusader then realized he had made a grave mistake. The investigator held up a box of medicines for the town to see. As the crusader heard the investigator's quietly uttered words, he fell to his knees in shock and horror. The doctor was killed last night. Haunted by his past, the survivor locks himself in a room and just wishes to live. The survivor was once a responsible bodyguard who protected the mayor night after night. Until one dark night, the bodyguard was foolish enough to yield to a beautiful consort who dazzled him with her seductive moves. Unfortunately, the next morning, the mayor was found dead. His killers, the mafia, went on a rampage soon after and destroyed everyone in their path. One man from the massacre had survived, the bodyguard, and ever since that day, he has confined himself to his mind, beating himself up over the fact that he could have prevented all of this from happening if it hadn't been for that consort. To this day, the bodyguard, now survivor, keeps four bulletproof vests that represent each party that played a role in the massacre. One for the town, who all died in the slaughter. One for the mafia, who led them to their deaths. One for the abandoned souls, who kept to themselves. And the final one for himself, to remind him of his selfishness. He saved himself, and his friends paid the price. The survivor's mind is clouded with the thoughts of his past, but one thing is clear for him. He must survive. At the graveyard, past the meadows of Salem, amidst the broken gravestones and drooping willow trees, a man strolls along a path every day. Nobody knows him or whatever he came here for, and he knows nobody, not even himself. Past the narrow path, he looks down to each crumbling slab of rock, at the worn names and chiseled last words from people whose faces he's never known. He imagines himself lying in the graveyard under a different face, under a different name. But one night under the round moon, he stumbles over one fresh gravestone that wasn't there the night before. Sifting aside the dirt, he reads a name and smiles at a jolt across his mind. He knows where he left off, and it's time for him to get back down to business. An anonymous elderly man sits up in his study's chair and begins to read his hate mail. The people hated the mayor's policies, but he had no choice. The rules had been designed to keep them safe from the conniving killers of Salem. He knew that on the day he would reveal himself as the mayor, he would have the town's support. He was simply waiting for the right time. And when that time comes, he knew that those who opposed town would tremble. Oh, how he would save a victory. Rain pours and lightning flashes through the sky as a skinny teenage boy pushes upon a wire gate to a dark trail surrounded by trees. He holds his books close to his chest glancing around for danger. The boy hears footsteps behind him and spins around but sees nothing but darkness. Turning around again, he bumps into three tall teenagers staring down at him. They throw him to the ground and throw his backpack and books across the wet grass. The boy wails for them to stop, but they don't listen. They kick him over and over until one of them pulls him up by the shirt. He feels blood dripping down his face as he is thrown back towards the fence. His body is filled with fear, but rage as well. As he wipes the blood off his face, he notices that his hand is covered in a thick layer of hair. A flash of lightning illuminating the night. The boy glances up at the sky. The full moon is caught in his gaze, and a loud howl escapes from his mouth. Obey. That was the only word he understood. 
Though he may seem like your average everyday townie, the story behind his grin is a grim, horrible and ghastly tale. The man is only known as the Mafioso. He dreams of only one thing, a brighter future for his whole family, especially for his beloved godfather. Just to achieve that dream, he will murder anyone his godfather wishes. Whether it be the mayor that once stood in the godfather's way, an investigator who tracked down the arsonist, or even a werewolf who killed the survivor that promised to stand by his side. He just doesn't care. Anyone who isn't on his side is deemed an enemy to the mafia. But what if the godfather was killed? Well, let's just say a replacement is already waiting. Red Cloth slips from the escort's shoulder as she tiptoes through the door. Her bare feet sink into the glowing cream carpet as she peers into the bedroom. She plasters a smirk onto her face as the man pulls open his top drawer, turning back towards her with a crisp bill in his hand. The Lady of the Night slips into his bed without a hint of apprehension. Tonight it is the Godfather, tomorrow it could be that uptight mayor and the next night, that introverted survivor. Money speaks in this town of chaos. The escort is but all too willing to listen. There had always been rumors of vampires, yet he did not believe in them. One day, he heard reports of people acting strangely and being incredibly sensitive to light. He then started hearing about sudden disappearances and vampires taking over towns. There were so many townspeople, good people, whose lives were taken by force and turned into a race that seeks to feast on the blood of others. If this continues, soon everyone will become a vampire. I must stop this, he said to himself. Others had tried to kill vampires with normal guns, yet they were converted before they could succeed. He vigorously studied the history of vampires, their weaknesses and their strengths. Armed with a bag of garlic, some holy water, and a wooden stake and a silver knife, he packed up and left his town, traveling to other towns that had been overtaken by vampires. He was determined to end the vampire bloodline before it was too late. She had never envisioned her life like this, and she never asked for it. One night, many moons ago, she was bitten. Merely a lookout at the time, she became much more ever since. To some, it was a blessing, and to some, a curse. She hadn't decided yet, but she knew it was a full moon, and she knew that meant she needed to feast. Skulking through the alleys of Salem, the vampire stumbled across the escort, paying a visit to a nearby home. The vampire felt bad for her, but she must feed. She lunged out at the escort, reaching her prey before it even knew what was going on, sucking the life out of her. She left the mangled, lifeless corpse in the alley. The werewolf's howls could be heard in a nearby home, but that didn't concern her. It was really on the lookout for the vampire hunter. He would be carrying his stakes and holy water, as the vampires would be active this full moon. But he was for naught. The hunter was too late to save the escort, so soon enough he would have another problem to deal with. She morphed into a bat and took off into the air, looking down on the town below, and as the faint beams of the sun began to peek out, she looked down upon all the residents of Salem, her soon-to-be meals. The tracker had always been good at what he did. He grew up in a family of hunters, where he learned everything about how to stalk, how to pursue, and how to act. There was always some noteworthy charisma that was imbued into him. Everyone gravitated around him. The town needed somebody like this, a person who could gain trust and relentlessly pursue a target at the same time. The tracker accepted this offer. He was willing to help out anybody who was in need of it. His first night on the job was somewhat compromised. He opened his door to a beautiful woman 
standing in front of him. A few drinks later, and it was business as usual for the tracker. He soon grew suspicious of this woman. There had to be something more to the night than just that. He followed her for a few days and found that she was visiting someone new every single night. The tracker slowly grew obsessed with this woman and tracked her repeatedly night after night. One day he went back home, frustrated after intently watching this escort and another man in bed. His rage remained until he found out his new obsession was dead by the cold blade of a deranged lunatic. Anguish washed over him. He was desperate for revenge. He told everyone the next day about how he saw the escort visit this man's house the night before her untimely demise. Nobody questioned him. This was the tracker's job. The accused was drenched in sweat as he felt all eyes on him. Then a rusty blade fell from his pocket. The tracker was in prime position to finish its prey. An ex-captain of the Salem Militia is infuriated by the increase of crime on the streets. His streets. Although the vigilante was fired for his violent and rash methods of war, he still has a strong sense of justice, or so he tells himself. As the death toll in the town rises, his anger only grows, as he finds the killer's identity obvious. That night, he makes his final heavy decision. If the town won't take down this fiend, he'll have to do it himself. He fishes the pistol out of the end table beside his bed, loading it with his two remaining bullets. One to kill, and one for backup. He usually doesn't miss, but it pays to be cautious. Using the shadow of night as his disguise, he sneaks into the suspect's house to find him cleaning a bloody knife. I knew it, the vigilante tells himself, his lips curling in disgust at the sight. Letting out a quiet, steady breath, he raises his gun and pulls the trigger. The target hits the floor, all signs of life disappearing from his now limp body. Pleased with the results, the vigilante slips back into his home and climbs into bed. He sleeps soundly, feeling as if a heavy weight has been lifted from his shoulders. The following morning, a panicked frenzy meets him in the square. The doctor has been discovered dead in his home, after performing surgery on a wounded patient. Nausea washes over him. He has killed a fellow town member. Self-preservation pins his lips together during the day, and misery drags his feet back home that night. He finds his gun resting on the end table, just where he had left it after slaying an innocent soul. The weight returns, crashing down on him heavier than before. One bullet left. The human mind is very complicated, is it not? A voice asked from the shadows of the room. What do you want from me? The man in the chair yelled, soaked in sweat with blood running down his cheek. The shadowy figure emerged and wiped off the blood. It's always important to make sure the client is relaxed before commencing with the process. Turns out if you know the right people, a degree in psychology can pay extremely well. The hypnotist walked towards the nearby consig. You sure it was the blonde guy on the corner that killed Tommy? He asked. Sure as I'll ever be, she replied, wiping the sheriff's blood off the rusted hammer. The hypnotist returned to the sheriff in the chair and gave him a firm slap across the jaw. This was so much more fun than working with those crazies in the asylum. Do you know that blonde man who lives three houses away from you? Yes, I do. He is a very bad man. He tried to hurt you tonight. The hypnotist knew that this was working. He was just thinking about how fun this would be to do on the mayor. He took out his pocket watch and let it swing in front of the man's face. We protected you. He tried to hurt you, but we saved you. You protected me, and he tried to hurt me. I will tell the town and stop the man from hurting anyone else, said the sheriff. Good, replied the hypnotist. The man silently took the sheriff back to his house to sleep. The man knew who would hang tomorrow, 
the Godfather would be very pleased. She waits until night falls, then gently takes out her crystal ball. She murmurs her secret words, foreign to others' ears, but warmly familiar to her own. The opaque clouds swirling within the glass clear away to reveal a shining, translucent orb of clarity. The town has called her foolish many times for meddling with fake magic, but they know not of the true nature of her powers. They say dead men tell no tales, but that isn't true for the medium. As she moves her hands lightly over the gleaming crystal, words from the souls of the dearly departed begin to appear before her. She sifts through their words, carefully looking for any snippets of information that may help the town. Her eyes light up. The town sheriff had found a member of the mafia, but had not been able to tell the town before being stabbed by the serial killer at large. The next morning, she informs her fellow townspeople of the sheriff's final discovery. The mafia member is hanged and the townspeople cheer, but this victory does not come without a price. She is shot the next day by the mafia, come to seek revenge for their brother's spilled blood. Her life may be over, but her job is not done. The next night, the medium performs her final miraculous act from beyond the grave. She speaks to the mayor of Salem, sharing the final pieces of information gleaned from the dead. As the night ends, she knows she can rest easy. The town will be all right. As darkness falls, a young boy walks home hand in hand with his mother. The medium gently tucks her son to bed. The boy drifts off to sleep. The only noises heard that night were a knock at the door and a faint scream. Awakening the next day, the innocent child stares in anguish at the body of the woman who raised and loved him. As tears fall from his face, he calls out, hoping to wake up from this nightmare. Receiving no relief to this pain, the weeping boy staggers into the town square to share the horrific news. Returning home that night, the broken boy collapses onto his bed. The boy looks up at the stars and wishes and prays to be with his mother again. As the sun rises on Salem the next day, a young boy walks into town hand in hand with his mother. I found evidence linking her to the mafia. The venerable sheriff declared as he pointed to the confused medium. He then pulled out a handful of crumpled notes, detailing the locations of shady out-of-town meetings at night. The medium tried to defend herself to the best of her abilities, claiming that one would have to be an abject fool to think that those notes could correlate to the mafia. But fortunately, or unfortunately in the medium's case, the sheriff's years of experience led him to believe that he really had genuine info. He led the medium's execution and then realized that as she breathed her last breath, she was framed. Her last will held not her words of dedication to the mafia, just the words of the deceased townsfolk. The framer noted the irony in the sheriff's spiel with his fellow mafia comrades while the rest of the town turned a blind eye to the incognito mafia. As the meeting for the day concluded and almost everyone went back to their homes, the framer congratulated himself. Who knew where a few old documents could get you? The coven leader became to be after failing her second attempt at destroying Salem. She realized that recruiting the mafia wasn't enough. She needed to start a coven. She traveled to different lands, recruiting the Hexmaster, Potion Master, Necromancer, Poisoner, and the Medusa. With their combined strength, surely now she would be powerful enough to destroy the town of Salem. A blind old woman sits deadly still on an armchair. Brushing a finger over the raised dots printed on the pages of her book. An esteemed medium, forced to quit the job due to vision problems. Yet from then on, the town began labeling her 
as the crazy lady. Neighbours would complain about eerie hissing noises coming from inside her house late at night. Whisperings would link the woman to a number of disappearances which only began to surface after her arrival. Rumours would pop up, claiming that the missing looked exactly like the terrifying marble statues on her garden, unwillingly protecting her abode. She knew someone would go out of their way again to approach her, and uncloak the arising suspicions surrounding the circumstances. The blunt sheriff was standing on her porch, impatient and eager to ask a few questions. He was smart, he was concise, and his interrogations quickly led him to an undisputable conclusion. She was a member of the Cult of Witches, the Coven. A threat to tell the town was all the Medusa could take. Unveiling a head of snakes and a monstrous visage, she forcefully gripped the sheriff's face in her cold, bony hands and glared into the helpless man's soul, until the once famed deputy was now nothing more than a new addition to the Gorgon's assortment of figurines. A blind woman sits deadly still on an armchair. Dare you look her in the eyes and suffer a same fate. Death is a natural part of life, is it not? And if so, then why is it feared? Why are we sad when our loved ones die? Shouldn't we be happy that they're in a better place? A little girl sobbed as she looked at the grave of her long deceased father. Her mother had resorted to drinking and was very rarely sober enough to interact with her daughter. The girl had no friends of any sort and she wasn't really interested in anyone at school. She was alone. The next day, however, everything changed, for better or worse. She caught a glimpse of a news article sitting on the table in front of her. She picked up the paper and began to read. It spoke of many trivial events, but there was one particular entry that caught her eye. Woman comes back to life, mother and son reunited. Her heart stopped. Come back to life? Surely that wasn't possible. But the more she thought about it, the more she hated the thought of someone else returning from death. What made that woman so special? Why didn't her father come back? It was unfair. She stood in her anger and envy, the first of many bad thoughts to come. Over the next few months, she researched the art of necromancy. She pored over the books in her local library, often staying up all night. All she wanted was to bring her father back. Eventually, she found a lead, a simple, black-covered book that exuded evil. She almost recoiled from its presence, but it was just too tempting. She knew instinctively that it would get her dad back. However, there was one thing she didn't account for. Death is final for a reason. The ritual went without a hitch. She saw her beloved dad's corpse dig its way through the soil he was buried in. But it wasn't the same man she had known her whole life. It was an empty minion, and the girl knew it. The Necronomicon had corrupted her, twisted her mind. She grinned ferally at the shadow of her father. It was time to repay the town for all the suffering she went through. When the Hexmaster was a child, her grandmother was burned at the stake on suspicion of witchcraft. As her belongings were being confiscated, one subject caught the Hexmaster's attention. It was a worn out book. Skimming through it, she could tell it was her grandmother's handwriting. It was a guide on curses. Something awakened in her that day. Exploring the book became an obsession, consuming every aspect of her life. Only one entry in the book eluded her powers. A hex of mass destruction. Every night, she sneaked to her grandmother's tombstone to attempt the curse using rats. Damn. The spell fizzled into dust. The rat's beady eyes felt as if they were taunting her. A fresh wave of grievance came over her. She grabbed one of the rats and flung it across the clearing. It landed by the grave the necromancer was reanimating, disrupting her concentration. Startled, she moved to where the hexmaster was working. The necromancer watched as she raised a hand towards her furry subject and recited an incantation towards a rat. 
She meticulously went through this process for each one. Upon hexing the final rat, strength began to flow through her fingers. It was manifesting itself as a soft purple glow. Moments later, the group of rodents' hair collectively stood on end. She took a deep breath and snapped her fingers. The blaze instantly left her hand and engulfed the rats, erasing them from existence. The necromancer made a noise of surprise and stepped out from behind her cover. Who are you? She rose from the cold dirt and turned to face the necromancer, who stared at the ashes in disbelief. Her devilish smile accurately conveyed the joy she felt finally executing this curse. I'm the Hexmaster. From a young age, the bartender of the local pub had a passion for mixing things. Whether it be milk and berries to make a smoothie, or cyanide and bait to make rat poison, she could make just about anything. As she progressed in age, more and more people came to try her concoctions. Even in her small town riddled with crime, she found solace in mixing the best beverages she could for her clients. But it wasn't enough. She was bored. She knew she could do better than this and decided to mix more interesting things. One such mixture was a special lotion that could heal almost any wound. It proved its merit when a maniac had stabbed the local doctor. Lathering it on the wounds, she watched as his frail body restored its cells and gave him breath. Another was a truth serum of sorts. It flooded the consumer with the urge to spill their secrets. Whether it be an embarrassing moment or a heinous crime, they simply couldn't resist telling the bartender exactly who they were. Although bartender wasn't enough to describe this girl anymore, she was much, much more now. The last of her special drinks was even more special than the others. Instead of making her targets talk, she could silence them forever. That boy who'd bullied her as a child, they found him dead in his bed. The teacher she hated all her life slumped over his desk. She was not bored anymore. A master engineer. It was his dream for years. He always wanted to be known for building great machinery. He decided to start small, building simple hunting traps. However, just after seven days of selling his traps, he was employed by the town's very own mayor to defend against recent claims of the Covenant Belt. He was recognized for his skill in building traps and was asked to build protective machines, and he has come up with the perfect trap for the job. He grabbed a bunch of reveal potions, spare metal, wood, and started to bend the materials into the masterpiece he was going to build. He looked at his creation and smiled. After setting up the masterpiece he had created, he left the home of the mayor, and he got shot as he went through the door. Ambushed, he was shot in his arm. He must have been taller than the ambusher expected. The trapper collapsed onto the floor. The ambusher walked up to him slowly, and strangely enough, the trapper smiled and got back up and quickly ran back inside. The ambusher, confused from his sudden ecstasy, chased inside after him and got trapped. The bear trap dug deep into his legs, and the pressure applied to the mechanism below only made it worse. The reveal potion hit his head, breaking into many shards, causing him to scream in pain. The ambusher dropped his gun from the pain, and then it was the trapper's turn to take aim. As a small-time attorney, the lawyer specialized in writing wills for her clients. But as her gambling debts grew, she required more money than she could legally make. She began to alter her deceased clients' wills to have a portion of their wealth distributed to various charities. These charities were just part of a shell game that increased the lawyer's bank account, wiping out her debt. No one noticed until the conciliary's father passed away who just so happened to be the client of the lawyers. Furious at the trickery displayed by the lawyer, the conciliary demanded she be killed. But the godfather looked at this with a level head and saw a plethora of potential. One phone call from the godfather later 
the lawyer became the forger. The janitor is just a lowly schoolhouse custodian. He takes the abuse of the townspeople's children, the taunts and the bullying. The janitor is used to it. This has been his life for as long as he can remember. But as he lies in bed one night, contemplating what he shall do, his door is broken in half, and in walks a large and rather intimidating man. He soon realizes he is the Godfather. Fearing for his life, he begs for mercy. The Godfather only laughs until he realizes who he's going to kill. A plan forms in his head. The janitor has the skill set to clean anything, even a dead body, wiping away any trace of a will or clues to what a lowly townsperson's role is. The janitor is offered a choice, use his skills for the good of the mafia or die. Anyone in their right mind would choose correctly. He grabs his mop and his bucket and follows the godfather outside. Revenge is sweet, but not dirty. The veteran laughed in the darkness. Afraid of the dark? No way. The man with his hand on the trigger of a gun laughed nervously. He wasn't scared of anything, he had told himself. His trigger finger twitched at simple shadows. His heartbeat quickened with every little sound. He was this scared of death. How could he not be? All he knew from being kidnapped and miraculously escaping from his enemies was that there was no mercy. His thoughts suddenly stopped at the sound of a door creaking open. Sweat began to show on his face as the steps started to become louder as it headed his way. Heart pounding like crazy, he lifted the gun up to the door. Suddenly, the door opened and he pulled the trigger. The stranger had dropped dead and so had his sense of worry. It was done. It was over. The blackmailer was born in a family of five with the least talent, looks, and athletic ability. He did, however, possess one talent, and this was the ability to find information most precious to people, information that they could not share with one another. Whether it be scandals, past history, or hidden secrets, the blackmailer would use this to silence his foes using hush tactics. He is determined to abuse this ability to its fullest extent to change this town with his fellow brethren and sisters in the secret society of the Mafia. She opens her eyes, gleaming with a faint orange glow of the candle and uncovers a deck of cards securely hidden within the folds of her robe. A deep breath, and she shuffles them with a vague sense of expertise. The psychic murmurs a short prayer, and shuffles the cards down in a line. Her gaze lies upon them, all embellished with a crimson design, each representing a specific villager residing in Salem. The red tarots were the manifestations of the negative traits living within each of the townsfolk. With her fingers carefully resting above the cards, she picks three. Flipping the trio over, she studies carefully their contents and proceeds to infer the possible individual or individuals blackened with a heart of darkness. Ares, the god of war. It represented the trigger-happy veteran, the judge of power. It was a card representing their highest ranking official, the mayor. A swift aura of complete realization empowered her, yet she was now forced to comprehend the risks she needed to take. Gripping the last tarot of the Hellfire in her hand, to accuse someone in their town was to put herself to the possibility of being called a fraud or even put to death. But to die, she concluded, has to happen to someone if they ever wish to find justice in their village. There was once a girl who liked to play pretend. Every day she got out her dolls, 
the fake teacups, and the imaginary friends. No one thinks twice when a little girl plays pretend. It was only a matter of time before the Mafia found her. Soon she became the disguiser. If anyone who the town trusts is killed, their place is taken by her. Now the girl gets out her makeup and latex, morphing her face until it's a perfect replica of who the Mafia killed that night. Then she takes her place among the town, taking the victim's name and talking for the benefit of the Mafia. With the trust of the town placed on her, it's too easy manipulating them to do as the Mafia pleases. The citizens were never expecting a disguiser to take their place, and when they find out of the trick that was played, the disguiser has already found a new skin to talk in. A scarring past is how the Jester became to be, born in the town of Salem. Once the Jester became an adult, they were sent away from being conscripted as a soldier to fight in a bloody war. After years in the battlefield, the sight of his fellow soldiers dying and along with the war experience had left him paranoid. The Jester's paranoia never went away and remained with him for years after when he was sent back to his hometown Salem. Every day, the Jester experienced his traumatic memories of the battlefield and twisted visions that everyone in the town is out to kill him. The memories of the traumatic experience and the fear that comes with it makes it hard for the Jester to bear to live and would rather accept to be killed and be liberated from himself, making him a target wanting to be lynched. Swift as the wind, the ex-ninja ran through the streets of Salem, entering a black forest. He dashed through the woods, graceful as a cheetah, until he saw a light ahead. He slowed down and expertly hid in a tree, silent as a thought. With the aid of his acute sense of hearing, he listened to the Mafia members discussing their future plans of terror and murder. The spy clenched his hands, knowing he could kill a man in 35 different ways, but he couldn't. This was a group of armed men, and he was merely a weaponless man with some knowledge on killing. It would be better if he let the town know who the perpetrators are, so they could dispose of them instead. In the daytime, those who he expected to die were lying on the ground, dispatched in front of their houses. The spy walked around, listening to everybody talk, knowing what everyone was whispering about. Using this information, he was able to judge who sounded like who, and who was part of the Mafia. The lookout knew that all the Mafia scum, and even some of the out-of-town maniacs preferred to work in the Night's Mask of Darkness, so sure that their deeds would be unseen by the sleeping citizens of Salem. Fortunately for the hapless townies, the lookout sneaks through the town night after night, repeatedly attempting to catch a criminal red-handed. A former night watchman, he decided that the best way to keep an eye on the criminals of Salem was to beat them at their own game. Under the mayor's orders, he slipped seamlessly into his environment to keep a watchful eye on his slumbering neighbors or any unexpected visitors while keeping the attention to himself as low as possible. And tonight his diligence had paid off. The next day, the town beauty was found cruelly assaulted and stabbed to death by the serial killer at large. As the town erupts into chaos as suspicion falls onto the escort's last client, the lookout silences them all before putting out his findings. With his leads, the town moves to lynch the escort's lone visitor while he attempts in vain to denounce the lookout as a member of the Mafia. As the suspicious visitor draws his last breath, a bloody dagger wrapped in a parchment falls out of his robes. The town breathes a collective sigh of relief and the lookout feels elated for just a moment before he slips back to his home much earlier than everyone else. In his usual focused demeanor, he watches the town once again from the shadows. A little girl and her grandmother were wandering in the forest just outside of Salem, where the raspberry bushes grew wild 
their baskets were overflowing, ready to make a delicious feast. As she ran over a hill, she saw a marvelous bush with dark blue berries and bright pink flowers. She simply had to try them. Her grandmother managed to limp over the hill. Old as she may have been, she recognized those berries from a mile away. She ran to the girl and slapped the berries out of her hand, frantically grabbing at her clothes, screaming, Please tell me you didn't eat any. And the girl nodded earnestly. That's a good girl. A moment passed, and she started screaming again. Don't you ever touch those plants. You hear me? Those could kill you. The girl nodded, having learned her lesson. A decade passed, and she had learned about every berry and herb in a hundred mile radius. They called her a freak at school, an orphan, a meaningless nobody. She was young and impulsive, but unfortunately, not stupid. She ground those berries from the very same bush that had nearly killed her as a child and poured the pulp into a pie. She went over to the worst bully of them all, the mayor's son, and offered him the pie. He ate it, and within a moment was dizzy and nauseous. The day after he was dead, the lookout screamed. She's the one who visited him two nights ago and gave him a laced pie. She's the murderer. Fueled by adrenaline, she ran and ran, and as fast as far as her legs could take her into the forest, where the town lost track of her. She kept on running until she ran into an older woman collecting mushrooms. The coven leader took the young girl under her wing, and decided that inexperienced as she may be, she had potential. She hid the girl from the town, on the agreement that the girl would work for the coven as the poisoner. No one should have to manipulate people on the whim of a higher power, but then again, no one would want to, either. A beautiful and unfortunate young woman had lost everything. She had nothing, no job, no home, no family or friends to turn to, not even hope, but eventually found salvation in the world of organized crime. As the sands of time flew forth, the consort began to embrace her position and over time executed her missions with confidence, tact and prestige. In the end, she had it all. Respect, power and most importantly, the love and trust of the Godfather. All she had left to fear in the world was the pedestal upon which her own execution could commence and the cold blade of a serial killer. The transporter has always been obsessed with inventions, gears, oil and springs. His nights are whittled away by fantastical ideas and what-ifs and has-beens and will-bees. Experiments involving carriages and hot air balloons produce steam-powered chariots, which he forces upon his prospect customers. When they discover his identity as a transporter, they may think that he's a pyromaniac who lit up City Hall. Or perhaps their investigations will reveal him as a potential witch. Who better to burn at the stake of Salem than a sorcerer who thickens the air with a filmy black smog? But there's always a chance that he will continue to evade capture by riding in his unique chariot. He will leave behind a trail of bodies, mafia, jester, and town alike. Screams rang through the cold night, and the doctor burst out of his house barely just grabbing his medical kit as he raced along the streets. Arriving at the source of unrest, he discovered a young boy lying down, coughing and sobbing. Instinct made the doctor cover his face with his trusty mask, and he was right in doing so. A closer inspection revealed the alarming truth, the red rash, the hacking coughs, and the huge black boils that had risen on the pale skin. This boy had the plague. The doctor should have been scared, worried, horrified. He knew this, but instead he felt fascination. How quickly could this disease spread? How many people could it kill? Hastily, he took a sample and commanded the boy's family to be quarantined. Then he hurried home to test this intriguing sample further. A week 
and the doctor finally held the result he was looking for. All he had to do was drop the solution on the path outside everyone's houses, and the fumes would infect everyone who ventured there. He started to question himself. And then he remembered the other doctor who always took credit for himself. The investigator who always snooped inside his house. The jailer who roughly threw him into a cramped jail cell. And he felt better. Quickly and silently, the doctor grabbed his solution and got to work. Inhaling the sweet scent of the herbs he put in his mask, the doctor infected person after person, using his dark robes to blend into the night. But on the fateful night that the plague spread to everyone in the town, the doctor realized its power. And as the moon was concealed under rolling grey clouds and the panic screams rose from the town, Pestilence, fourth horseman of the apocalypse, laughed so hard that tears rolled off his mask. <laughs>